located approximately 160 kilometers northwest of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Das Island is a center of oil and gas processing, storage, and export operations. It was day 31 of the ADGAS 2008 major overhaul of LNG Train 2. LNG Train 1 was operating only on high-pressure gas that day, but its sulfur plant was out of commission, resulting in flaring of sour gas composed of 31% H2S and over 60% CO2. The last phase of mechanical work was underway before preparations to restream the train in readiness for gassing. In order to meet the gassing date, a number of jobs had to be completed by the end of the night shift, including some hot work. The restreaming procedure prohibits lining up of the flare system until hot work has been completed. At 1900 hours, a briefing took place between the operations turnaround team leaders and the night shift coordinator and senior shift operator. The major activity for the shift operations was the recommissioning of the flare system, which involved de-spading valves in the sweet and sour gas crossover lines. This was to be followed by the opening of the isolation valves in the train 2 flare system. At 22.10 hours, the permit to work for the de-spading was raised and the hot work permit was signed off by the area authority. Five spades were listed in the de-spading permit, two in the utility pipe rack and three on the platform in the north battery limit. A supervisor and four-man crew were initially dispatched to the utility pipe rack. This contravened procedures as the 16-inch sour gas spade in the north battery limits should have been despaded first as instructed by the night shift coordinator. After finishing work on the utility pipe rack, the crew took a short break. At around 0130 hours, the despading crew commenced preparation to despade the remaining three spades in the north battery limits under breathing apparatus in line with the permit conditions. The crew started with the 4-inch 1901 sour liquid spade and then moved on to the 20-inch 1904 sweet vapor spade before the shift changeover. At 0230 hours, the operation supervisor was instructed to start opening up the valves to line up the flare. O500 hours at the sour gas crossover flare lines in the north battery limits and on an elevated platform, a replacement crew arrives to continue the despading schedule on the remaining 16-inch sour gas spade. The supervisor and safety technician remain with the new crew, but unable to wear his breathing apparatus due to facial hair, one of the new fitters had to leave the platform. The supervisor and a fitter start debolting the 16-inch spade. At 0515 hours, on the verge of breaking the spade, the supervisor and fitter don their breathing apparatus and signal for the two other members of the team to leave the platform and return to grade. 0531 hours, and the spade is broken, setting off the gas alarm. The safety assistant and the other fitter are still on the platform without breathing apparatus. The turnaround team leader receives a call over his radio reporting a gas leak and immediately requests to call the DAS fire and rescue services. The BA technician, located on the ground level, smells gas and calls to two workers nearby warning them to vacate the area. Attempting to pull the BA trolley set the BA technician initially collapses, overcome by gas. Soon after, he regains consciousness and manages to make his escape to a safe area. The facial hair fitter, having previously come down from the platform, is sitting on a bench at grade. 
he manages to stagger about five meters before he too is overcome by the gas and collapses below the pipe rack. At 0535 hours, the fitter and the safety assistant start to descend the caged ladder from the platform above. Halfway down, trying to escape, but overcome by gas, the fitter falls, landing on the ground at the base of the ladder. He is immediately followed by the safety assistant, who strikes his head against the ladder cage before landing on top of the fitter at the base. At 0536 hours, three casualties are rescued from the scene and taken to the front of the amenities building, then on to marshalling point three. An emergency is declared at 0539 hours, yellow status, by the head of shift operations. By 0547, the fire services and ambulance arrive at the scene. The supervisor and fitter are still fitting the flange bolts and tightening the joint when their air supply fails. Both remove their masks and notice a number of people waving to them to come down to grade. They have smelt no trace of gas throughout the whole tragic incident. Out of the four casualties removed from site and evacuated to DAS clinic that day, three survived, one with a broken leg. The safety technician's fall resulted in a fatal head injury. In the aftermath of the incident, the Board of Inquiry team identified a number of causes and made a series of recommendations. The findings were divided into three categories. Immediate causes, root causes, and indirect contributory causes. The immediate causes of the incident were found to be the release of a high concentration of toxic gas, H2S, exacerbated by the sulfur plant being out of commission. An inadequate use of PPE. Only two out of the four contractor employees were wearing breathing apparatus. And falling from height. The Board of Inquiry team found the root causes to be non-adherence to operating procedures. The isolation valves were opened before removal of all spades. A lack of hazard awareness. The status of train one, plant seven, was not known to the turnaround team. The safety procedures were not adhered to. The contract supervisor did not adhere to permit requirements. And finally, non-adherence to permit to work procedures. The area senior operator approved the hot work permit without checking the site first. In addition to these, the indirect contributory factors identified were a lack of H2S awareness. The contractors did not understand the risk of H2S, consequence of its inhalation and the importance of the self-rescuer. There was a perceived pressure to meet the turnaround gas in target. Contractor substandard safety performance. It was evident from the investigation that contractor safety performance was poor as a result of the high number of near misses reported, over 700, more than 100 permit to work violations, and the lack of understanding of the role of the breathing apparatus safety technician by the contractor workforce. As a result of the investigation, a total of 34 recommendations were made covering the review of the permit to work system and to ensure that it is rigorously implemented and closely monitored. A further recommendation was that ADGAS maintenance personnel should carry out critical activities when de-streaming or re-streaming a train. The Board of Inquiry team also recommended that instructions for the BA standby should be thoroughly reviewed. All personnel must undergo H2S awareness training and additionally toolbox talks and the HSE induction must reinforce the importance of the portable self-rescuer. Operating procedures must ensure that the lining up of the flare system cannot be started until the sour vapor and liquid crossovers have been despaded. And finally, procedures must be in place to ensure that clear communication is established between the operations team and the overhaul team. Ad gas management and shareholders are acting on the recommendations from the Board of Inquiries to ensure that communication, training 
and the permit to work system are improved to guarantee that such incidents do not recur.